Pitch Talks special feature. Hey, what's up, people? Straight Shooting LJA here, and you know what? I want to welcome you to this Pitch Talk special feature. Now, me and the guys recently had a conversation about Meza Urzel and the situation that he's got at Arsenal. We're calling this special feature Arsenal and the Urzel conundrum. Now, as many of you may know, recently Meza Urzel was omitted not only from the Premier League um, squad for Arsenal for the 20, um, 2020 2021 season but also the Europa League squad as well. Obviously, he's still got time to run out on his contract, but we go, we, we take kind of a deep dive in regards to that contract situation, and we speculate on reasons as to why he's been frozen out, because there's been a lot of guesswork and a lot said, but here's our conversation, our special feature segment on Ozil, Arsenal, and I said, we're titling it Arsenal and the Ozil Conundrum. I'm looking at it from sort of a football point of view and a and a, and the opposite side point of view. Um, look at what happened with Lucas Torreira. Lucas Torreira, in my opinion, was probably going to be another player who could play as a defensive midfielder and was doing well in his first season. Then all of a sudden, we decided to play him a little bit further up because we thought he was going to be a Kante. Now, to me, that didn't make any sense. He was happy with the the tackles. He was happy with doing it where where he needed to, and he was he was all over the place. He was he was doing it in the right way, um, and that left that left um, Ozil to to pretty much play passes through. Yes, that was under Unai Emery. Um, with Mikel Arteta and who his pre who his mentor was um, in. Guardiola and then looking at Guardiola who his mentor was in Bielsa and the people that they've been around in terms of Pochettino and Simeone it's all about hard work on and off the ball especially off the ball um, so it's all about the positional st- positional stuff Ozil doesn't give that um, because it kind of tends to be well everybody else has to defend and we've got to leave Ozil and possibly another two on their own I've seen it with with teams over the years, and I understood it with um, somebody like Podolski. I was like, "Well, why is he not playing? Why is he not starting?" And then I realised, off the ball, he looks lazy. He just looks unequivocally lazy, and it just didn't help didn't help the team. The same with a few other players. You always get them in in your team, and you think, "Well, if they're not going to do the job, then that doesn't fit the um, the mould of the of the team." So that was the first thing. The second thing, the second thing I think was a little bit of a political situation. He did speak out about China, um, and that's one of the places that Arsenal have a bit of a of a following. So where China of of um, have categorically and rather shamefully um, put pe- um, put Muslims into concentration camps, and pretty much it's almost it's almost a, a way of um, doing the gas chamber without actually people knowing. Um, yeah, they've they've done it again this year, and it pretty much started last year. But it was only mentioned just before the coronavirus, um, and he and he pretty much said said his piece. And yeah, remember he's also Muslim, so again he's got he's got something to say on that. I mean, the thing is, though, some would say, "What the hell have Arteta or Kroenke got to do with China?" Um, apart from backhanders. Yeah, um, Torreira, he was a little pit bull. Um, quality DM, and he gave you guys some bite in the midfield. But um, but Ozil do- definitely doesn't give that work, but creative creative and flair players, I mean, you have to give that leeway. I mean, you look at, in the past, Cantona, Letizia, Berbatov, the, the list goes on. But yeah, I see what you're saying, Jamie, about yeah, the following from China bringing in a global market. So it means when Arsenal have matches in China again I mean if they play Ozil there could be problems at board level that's a fair shout um, I mean also yeah De Bruyne and others working off the ball as well as on it no you, again you're right Jay it, 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 it's yeah it is true they do work hard I'll go back to the, fo- the football inside Ozil does give you what you need in the final third possibly in the middle third but it has to be on the opposite um, side of the halfway line. So yes, Jordan Henderson will um, will go anywhere and do whatever he can just to, to win the ball. But that's been instilled by Jurgen Klopp. Whereas 
Ozil's been through what three different managers, and all and all knew, everybody knew, what his his um his special tactic was, which is giving the ball, let him find those those um through passes, off the ball. He's not there. He's not there. And the reason why um, Ronaldo was upset when when Ozil left is because he no longer got that service, so he had to create it for himself. Um, so yeah. That's that's the that's the one thing that I've I've noticed from the footballing side is that those type of players when you've got somebody like an Ozil, you also got to remember his his wage his wage is is quite high. He's I think the highest played highest paid player after um, before Birmingham signed his um his, his contract, and now he's one he's he's pretty much on a massive probably a massive bonus as well. Um, and I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised that that might be the reason why he's being frozen out because. If you play a certain number of games or get to a certain number of um, things, then you get a bonus and blah 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 and so on and so forth. Which means that if, in the grand scheme of things, there is that reason financially, Arsenal have done the right thing. But on the opposite side, you could also think, well, you need to you need to ship him off. I don't think they've been able to ship him off because of his wage wage demands. But the only place that he could go to, ironically, is China. He wouldn't go to uh, um, Dubai. There wouldn't be any point. Um, I don't think he would. He would enjoy the the lifestyle over there. Um, and the only other club, uh, the only other clubs that could really pay that type of money, would be China. So, there's your answer. Um, I think those are the three things. Financially, it's a it's a bit of a tough deal. His political views. It's going to probably be, I don't think it's going to be down to that too much, but possibly could be. And then his off the ball work. As a coach, you really want a, a midfielder to actually do something, even if they're not going to, even if they're not going to press, just do something. And I don't think he does that for, for any of the, um, any of the teams that he's played for. So basically the global market and Arsenal being concerned about their finances. I mean, yeah, that's understandable, but if you're that pissed, transfer list. Um, don't have the guy rotting in the reserves on two, three hundred k a week. I mean, that's just counterproductive if the club are worried about finances and making redundancies, which they have. Um, but as I said for years, most clubs are badly run businesses. In terms of Ozil speaking out about, um, yeah, I think it was China and the Ugears, Ergears. Um, John Oliver did a segment on it on um, last week tonight. But yeah, as mentioned earlier, it is a case of creative players do need a bit of license to be creative. Um, but again, Jamie, yeah, I mean, when Ozil signed the contract, it is a case of who was in charge. Um, I mean, once Wenger, once Wenger went, the deal was done and Emery came in. Um, so that was the deal o- o- Ozil was always going to want up. No, I mean, I mean, that's fair play, but then clubs don't need to honour deals, though. I mean, especially financially. But in theory, I mean, Ozil could go to MLS. I mean, certain clubs can afford it, but his political views, I think, could have burnt bridges. But um, you're right, though. It is tough to remove a player such as Ozil when the only place he can really go is China based on finances. Again, Jamie, that's actually a good point. To me, it sounds like WCW with the guaranteed contracts. You know, everyone's giving away stupid money and not knowing whether they'd have a long-term future together. Um, not knowing whether the person's going to be a draw or not. I mean, Usmanov and Kroenke were still playing that like, brinksmanship with each other um, when he was signed. So it'd be interesting to know if it was Kroenke or Usmanov who signed the Ozil deal off and why they signed it off. I mean, was it to get back at the other? Or, But yeah, I mean, fair point on Ozil just taking the money. I'm actually um, looking to do a vlog talking about just that issue, actually. Um, high wages and players not necessarily being to blame for taking the money, but they're vilified for it and not the clubs or owners. Yo, those are all valid points, man. All valid points. The, the one thing that annoys me, though, about this whole situation is just the, the lack of hindsight or the lack of foresight, should I say, by Arsenal. Because... At the end of the day, what, was it 2018 that they gave Ozil his new contract? So, are you telling me in 2018 when they decided to sign off on a 350,000 contract, their plan was to, on the last year, 
put Ozil out of the Europa squad and put him out of the um, the Premier League squad? Nope. Was last year was when he signed the 2018 contract? Was last year was they was their plan to isolate him from the team? Nope. In 2018, when they signed a new contract, when they had Arsene Wenger, yeah, for for whatever reason, they gave Ozil that contract because clearly now we can see they never saw a future with Ozil. They definitely didn't see a future with Arsene Wenger. So how they can sign off a big contract like that for Meza Ozil and he was an Arsene Wenger player just shows the lack of foresight, stupidity, um, the, the gullibility of whoever was in the department's <laughs> that control these things and some are going to say it's down to Gazidez and Wenger but no this is beyond the Gazidez and Wenger because at the end of the day there's still a money man in front of those two guys um, that has to to give the okay and we know that for a fact especially when we get told that Thomas Partey signing was signed off from Cronkay himself do you get what I'm saying and um, the Pepe signing as well so so we can't have these mixed messages uh, try to blame it on Gazidas and Wenger, yeah? Yeah, for all those years we're blaming stuff on Gazidas and Geng- Wenger, yet yeah, we've seen the patterns of how they struggled to get money and sign certain players. And then all of a sudden we're seeing players getting signed off, yeah, for big big money, big wages, yeah? And they're getting signed off directly from the top. So clearly the top has always had a hand in, you know, what happens in the transfer market. Um, and in terms of the lack of foresight now, now we've got a player that's sitting on the bench, yeah, who, not even he's not even, even sitting on the bench because he can't sit on the bench, he's not even in the squad. Yeah, we've got a player that's not even in the squad, that's on 300,000 a week, that's generating so much bad negative press around the club, yeah, Clear, I have no issues with Ozil wanting to sit down and take his money at this point because at the end of the day, I've said it um, in other WhatsApp groups to have some other friends and I'll say it in this group as well. I don't think no one in this group, yeah, would honestly yeah, say that if they were in his predicament, they wouldn't do the same thing at his stage in life. At 30, 31, just had a child, I think he's got two kids, Get me, he's happy in London, like you said, um, Jamie. Do you know what I'm saying? He's on the last year of his contract. What you think, man's gonna walk away from an 18 million pound contract because um, the football club that you love all of a sudden have decided that you're you're redundant to them? No way. No one's walking away from that. No one's. I don't think no one in this group's stupid enough to walk away from that. Do you get me? At the end of the day, there's even if he was to come up with a deal with Arsenal, yeah. They, they're not going to pay him anything close to 18 million. So it doesn't make sense. Like, business-wise, like, it just doesn't make sense. It's it's frustrating because when, when we're looking at the, the Europa squad and we're looking at the Premier League squad, they're literally, like, just slapping man in the face and telling him, like, there's certain men in... I'm not going to bring up names. I'm not going to diss our players here, but they're just saying certain men are, are, are more warranted of a place than him. Yeah, there's players that are not even worried of a place in that squad just via credit, you get me, for what he's brought to the club. Like, and again, I, I hear what people say about, you know, what he brings to the team and what he doesn't bring to the team. But again, that's that's just the type of player. Like, you've got different type of players for different things. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, you, you don't expect a Bamiyang to to be defending like Harry Kane, just because Harry Kane's defending, doing all this defensive work and running around like a madman at Tottenham now. That that would be crazy. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, you don't expect, um, for instance, Yaka to turn into to, um, Kante, like Arsenal fans were at one point, thinking that he was going to be the next Kante. Like, you can't. You, you've literally got to play to your players' strengths. And Ozil's strength, maybe... He's not a starter. Maybe he 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 he's 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 um basically not a guy that can play seventy minutes. But at the end of the day, when we're watching the football that we're watching, yeah, and we're playing games where literally, um, no, there's no created chances 
or no shots on goal within like 40, 60 minutes, yeah? And you've got a man that's on 350,000 a week, yeah? At home, yeah? Can't even get into the squad. And you know that record says that he can unlock defences, unlock midfields with one through ball, yeah? And you're not willing to take a risk on that just because cause, cause of some pride thing, because you're trying to get him rid, rid of him and he doesn't want to go. You might as well use him. Like it, it just doesn't make sense. And what's a smack in the fans' face is the fact that they're constantly telling us, boom, they can't afford certain players and they've, we've got to live within our means and all of this type of thing. But you can afford to have someone that's on, again, 350000 a week, which is basically what? Nearly what? A, mi- a million, a million point two before tax, yeah, a month. That's crazy. That's insanity, man. Seriously, that's insanity. Like, there is no logic behind what's happening with Ozil right now. There's no logic. But it is interesting. You mentioned, Gav, about what's interesting but frustrating is what Jamie said about his work rate position and etc. And as a coach, Jamie, like, kind of assuming those things will be discussed before giving the man a bumper contract. Um, I mean, giving him that sort of wage, if that's the case, can't be football related then. I mean, that that's actually a fair point. Because, yeah, you, before you sign the player, you know what to expect from him. And, yeah, that frustration um, about it, giving him that sort of wage can't be football related. I mean, that's why I tongue-in-cheek um, made the joke about him bang, banging Arteta's wife or something. Um, a little more sinister. The most common sense thing that they could do was to phase him out this season. So if you are going to use a Willock or a Smith role or even Caballos, you get me? You're alternating and so man's getting like 25 minutes here, 25 minutes there, 50 minutes, a start. Do you get me? Whatever. But at the end of the day, it would it would completely basically shut down this whole notion of, um, you know... Whether this complication that's happening at the moment, basically, would just shut that down. Do you get me? That we wouldn't even be talking about that. If, all, if he was just in the squad and he was just playing games here and there, we'd shut that down. Like I honestly, I just do not get this Ozil situation. It's it's head scratching. Arsenal are wasting money. Yeah, do you get me? Like if this, oh, I don't I don't even know what to say, man. I don't even know what to say. Like and as as for the um. The um, China thing that that definitely, definitely, is a factor. I don't care what no one says because before um, the break, or not even a break, before COVID struck, he was in Arteta's plans. He was in the team. He was playing consistently. Do you get me? Yeah, he wasn't on fire, but no one was on fire. If we can all like just put our honest hats on, no one was on fire. Yeah, after the break, he can't get into the team. Why can't he get into the team all of a sudden because of what he had said? It's, 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 it's. I'm, I'm. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Like Arsenal ain't doing themselves any favor, favors here, in my opinion. Um, do you get me? They can, they can try and use all these shammy, shammy excuses about money and and how he plays and laziness, but no one's actually buying that. And what's going to be embarrassing? Yeah, is. When his contract is over, he takes his money, he gets another big contract, and you say that he can only go to um, um, what's it called, China? But that, that's that, and I don't, I don't believe that he can he can go somewhere in Europe. He can go, he can potentially, and he doesn't have to get a mega big contract. He can go somewhere in Europe, somewhere like Italy. He can potentially go to America. Um, do you know what I'm saying? Like at the end of the day, he's on the tail end of his career. It doesn't mean he, he's like a moving circus now. He's like Zlatan, like he can just float. He doesn't have to get the big contracts, but he'll he'll definitely play. And I'm I'm I, I I honestly believe he will put in performances and he's gonna put us to shame. But yeah, I mean it is one of them ones where yeah, you don't buy Salah Romane to defend um or do what Henderson and Fabinho do. Um, not saying they shouldn't help but they're ultimately out there to attack and create chances and score and yeah you need to be let off the leash um, and I mean yeah some young players could actually study under the learning tree as well I mean you could use Ozil as an experienced player in that way so at least you're getting something out of him 
be phasing him out and putting him in the shop window um, to get clubs interested in him to at least try and make some money off him as opposed to letting him go on a free and paying these absurd wages whilst he runs down this contract would make sense. Very good valid points and I hear what you're saying. Very good valid points. The thing that you got to remember when he, signed, when he signed, and the thing that everybody's got to remember, regardless of whether it's this group or any group, when he signed his contract in 2018, it was pretty much one of the last things that Wenger said that he, he had to get, get done because he knew how, how important Urza was. Funny enough, he leaves literally after that contract is signed a few months later, which is fine, it's cool. But then you bring in Emery. Now, Emery doesn't know the players as well. So he's trying to find his way and he's trying to build his his way of, of playing and his style. He doesn't really know Ozil, but everybody's boasted about this guy. Now, obviously, he's now watching how he plays and he's just trying to put things together in, in certain places. Hence the reason why you saw the type of um, type of play um, we were playing with, with the back three, with the back five, with the back four. Whatever it was, he was just trying to work things out, and he didn't really get the chance just to, just to see where that was going. Just simply because of, I would say, fan outrage that we weren't doing doing so well. And yeah, Jamie. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a case of, yeah. So, I mean, Salah and Mane, you don't buy them primarily to defend. And yes, our best attack is defense, and when the front with the front three winning the ball high. Um, in in high areas, we can counter attack quickly. Um, you no longer buy a player or bring one through the ranks that does one job. You buy them for their mentality. No oh, fair play. Um, can they accept playing this way? Can they adapt to play in a certain way? If we have to defend high, would that suit, would they suit the team? Could we play this player in a different position to get the best out of the team? Will they add depth to our squad? Will be a key player in our plans for the season. All, all those things go into player recruitment no longer about what they do on the ball it's what they give you in the club off the ball on the pitch um, how they train their style of play are they adaptable and can they give a squad a, give the squad a character to look up to no matter the work they do on the pitch case in, case in question on that last point in my opinion David Luiz I mean that's all fair points there um, Jamie that's all fair points and as you said, Gav, yeah, good points. It's just sad to see it all play out this way, especially with someone as gifted as Meza. Um, I wasn't expecting any fairy tale ending, however, and I was expecting him to play this season. It would be nice to see him play with that solid DM box to box player we now have in Thomas Party. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, from an Arsenal perspective, you want to see him see him do well. Um, you, and again, for the club, you don't want to see him frozen out like that. To me, when I look at it, well, that's what's going to happen. If you look at the Liverpool situation, thirty years, they weren't winning any, uh, weren't winning much. But that was the difference. Whereas they were trying to build on something, and it just wasn't working until they found Jurgen Klopp, and that's thirty years after winning the league. So, again, we were always in a transition period, and that's where it should have been. Now, I do agree with the fact that he's. He should be playing, regardless. But I also look at it from the other side and you think, well, if we're going to give leeway, as Liam says, then we have to build the team around him. And that's the problem. How do you build a team around one one player? It used to be like that. We don't. We did that with Henri, we did that with, with so many players, and then all of a sudden we we became a, a more, more of a, an open team, which... We don't build around one player, we just build around a collection of players. Um, Wenger tried to do it with the English, then um, he did it with the French, then he did it with the English, and and eventually it, it just panned out. Now, if he's going to go to a club in Europe, great. PSG will probably have the funds. Juventus will probably have the funds. But after that, you've got to ask the question of who's going to have the funds after that. AC Milan? Yeah, great. But then he has to get, he's going to have to take a pay cut. So, yes, I agree. I'm going to sit here and say, you know what, if I'm getting 300000 a week, I'm going to sit there. But at the same time, one is 32. Two, for him and his kids, yes, London is probably the best place to, um, to be at the moment. But at the same time, well, as a footballer, would you want to sit on the bench? No, he's not going to get into the German squad anymore just because of the way he's he's spoken um, about the sink, this, uh, I think it was Camille Kosogi. So, again, he's talked about his 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 past. Uh, it's not his past. Uh, his political views. Um, 
on Camille Kasogi and and I think he mentioned how great um, Turkey was. That that's another thing. That's so he. I'm not saying that he's burnt his bridges, but it's also a case of he's allowed his views to to open open the gates, and he's been the he's been the guy that's that that's been the full guy for people to go. Oh wait, hold on. So he can stand up now. Um, and that's sometimes what it takes one person just to just to take the fall for everybody else to go and talk if he is to play somewhere else and he's to, and he's to do his best great wonderful I, I really do I really do think he's he's that good of a player but again you got you got to go back to the that contract whether it's 18 million that he's getting a year or whatever it is it's tough because if you look at uh, when when teams go go down relegation wise I go back to the, my time at QPR. They had, I think it was Sean Wright Phillips on on the books as one of the highest paid players. Julio Cesar. They had to get both of them off the books because of their wages, not because of what they could do on the pitch. It was just literally because of their wages. And I was just looking at that and I'm going, well, yes, that's what QPR has done. Yes, Arsenal have, have kind of messed this up as well, but that's that's where it's coming from. It's a case of, well, we just got to balance the books. Yes or no, whether it's to do with somebody's fault or whatever, financially, politically, football-wise, there are three things that are going probably against him rather than for him. And it probably does hurt with the way that we're playing. But at the same time, I go back to, to the one the one person that Arteta's, um, Arteta's mentor was. Yaya Torre and Pep Guardiola. Remember what happened when he went to Barcelona. Yoyo Torre was pretty much frozen out literally straight away. Wasn't even given the time of day and then sold to um, to Manchester City. Pep Guardiola comes to Manchester City. What happens? Does the same thing. Literally the same thing. So it's it comes down also to an, another thing which could be philosophy. If I'm talking about philosophy, I'm talking about how a philosophy can can work to adapt those those type of players. And what essentially um, Arteta has probably learned is stick with your philosophy no matter what happens. Um, if you have to move players on, you have to move players on. Now, to me, that that kind of doesn't sit well. And if you can't sell the guy on, yes, you should. You should just um, probably give him a, a give him a chance. Give him a chance, even if you don't give him a, a, an option. I still agree with you as well, G-Man, about phase him out over the season. But again. There's too many factors, in my opinion, that makes makes this all the more a case of he's just going to tell him, nah, can't have you in the team. And hasn't for, for quite a while. The China thing probably was the, uh, the the straw that broke the camel's back. But then at the same time, there's other things that have, have been, been put in place. I think the, the worst thing is the fact that the two titles that, um, that he's won, the FA Cup and the Community Shield, without Ozil, pretty much shows what he's doing right and it kind of hurts it a little bit to kind of say well that's that's a facade that's a bit fake because it doesn't uh, it doesn't show what he's um what this team can be about if players start to play play well i think he will draw on on Ozil's experience just like he's done with david luis in in january he will go and say you know what we need you back Let's just try and get the best out of you for six months. Or he will try and look to sell him as much as possible so that they can get into a, get into a deal that's going to be worth twice as, as much as Partey. I don't know, but that's that's what it is. Um, I still think there's something more sinister at play with Ozil being frozen out in the way he has been. And of course, Ozil won't burn bridges or rock the boat and jeopardise his paycheck. But yeah, in... In regards to over 30 years since we won, since we last won the league, well, before last season, well, we did win a lot. I mean, we won almost every trophy that matters or isn't defunct, and some of them twice, almost three times over. Um, but yeah, in regards to to that point about high wages, I mean, and getting players off the books, I mean, remember Christopher Samba? I mean, his wages were high too, but especially now, books need to be balanced. I mean, usually with leaving out a quality player such as Zaha from, say, a Palace side, if he's not injured, then you're doing it purely to send a message to the player, in my view. The one thing that I will say is, when he signed the contract, did they know what was going to happen? Of course not. 
nobody um, nobody foresaw the coronavirus in 2018. Nobody foresaw the um, Wenger leaving in, tw- in, in 2018. Nobody foresaw um, all the other things, and I'm not saying that Emery and 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 Arteta couldn't have played them, but I think now you're kind of seeing what the problems what the problems underneath are, are starting to starting to become. Is one person will say, you know what? Well, this is how we should play, um, and then another will say, well, no, this is how this is how it should be done, and then it just leaves you with conversations of going, well, you know how good that person was, but now they're no longer in the team. It's like it's like Roy Roy Hodgson leaving out um, Zaha. Absolutely pointless. He knows how important his that player is, but at the same time, he's going to leave him out. Well, there's it. There's the conversation. It's the same thing with I don't know. Um, if I look at the Derby team now, Derby County, they need uh, Wayne Rooney on the pitch as well, as much as they need him off of it. Yes, he's meant to be a coach, but at the moment he's still playing into um, well into his, his um, later years of of, um, of his contract. Yet he's meant to be getting a lot more coaching experience. So you look at that and you go, well, Derby need him on the pitch more than they need him off of it at the moment. So you just have to you, you just roll with the punches sometimes. I think that's what that's what is, that's, um, has happened at the moment. And I'm not right. I'm not wrong. I'm just giving an opinion. I just think whatever's happening um, between everybody at, at the club, hopefully it gets sorted out within the next couple of years. I don't know if it's Kroenke or Gazidis or Wenger or whoever, Emery, but just look at the changes that have been happening on the coaching staff and backroom staff and all of that, and then you'll realise that things have been moving forward. Um, and if players are not ready to move forward with it, then they get left out. That's That's the reality of it I think managers are no longer um, are no longer looking at it and going well I have to play this person and then have the same um, same results it's now a case of well that's not happening I can bring in my players and I've been given that I've been given that option to do so so I'm going to try and do it it's a lot of good points that you guys have made um, so in terms of Mesut Ozil um, it's a combination for me is a, is a bit of a disappointment um, in the sense that obviously much was hoped for when he came to Arsenal. Um, I remember the elation of our fan base um, when he when he arrived, and there was a lot of expectation around his assist record and you know being being the big name that he was at the time, still is to some degree. Um, the feeling was was that it was going to be a, a an upturn in Arsenal's fortunes. Um, and his stats in the, the first two or three years or so is relatively good. It wasn't brilliant, but it's relatively good. Um, but then we've seen a, a significant decline. I think when you go back to the back end of Arsene Wenger's time at the club, um, Arsene Wenger um, played him no matter how poorly he played, um, which was consistent with the incompetence that was beset within the club. Um, you know what I mean? I, and there was times when he should have been dropped and he wasn't. Emery could see that when Emery was at the club and Emery didn't use him either. Um, and now Arteta has also adopted a similar approach. And my view is, is that it's, I think it's personal. Um, I think that it also amounts to the fact that the man earns what he earns, refuse to take a pay cut, whatever you may want to think about it. Some may say that he doesn't have to take the pay cut, but many will consider that given the circumstances in, around the world right now, the circumstances at the club, etc., that he could have done more. He may argue that when it comes to um, charity events and other things that he's put his hands in his pocket. So I think there's a lot of politics around that. And, and it, it would appear from what I can establish that the board, Cronkies or whatever, I've just said, you know what? This guy ain't playing for our club again. Do not play him. And I think that's the instructions come from the top. And Arteta isn't playing him. But then when I look at Arsenal, um, there's two factors. I mean, we lack creativity and and that's why I say it's a blow because I'm looking at it in that if he plays for us, it gives us an ounce of creativity. Having said that, I I look at those games that he's played in and where you would think he would do that and he hasn't. So it's it's the balancing act as to whether there is enough of an input from him in a game which merits him playing week in, week out. And one of the things I heard Arteta say recently 
was that this Arsenal team has evolved. And what he means by that is that the team work a lot harder. They do a lot more. He gets a, he gets a lot more out of them than what others have done. I feel Emery, in his first season, he got a lot more out of the Arsenal team players as well. And Mesut Ozil has never been one to bust a gut up and down the pitch. Mesut Ozil's best work is in the last third of the pitch, with time and space, with the ball at his feet to pick out a pass. And you guys know from following football that in the Premier League, that is few and far between. To get that in, in, in the game is, is very, very rare. Unless you're playing... You know, if you're playing Fulham at home and they're going to give you time and space, and Mesut Ozil is going to look like, he's going to look like the, one of the world's greatest players because he's got time, he's got space, he can pick a pass. But when you come, against, come up against teams who don't give you that, some will argue that Mesut Ozil is less effective. So all round, it's, it's a blow to us. Um, but at the same time, we've got to look at the wider benefits. He'll be gone at the end of the season. His wage bill comes off, off, our, um, off, our, um, off, our, off our budget and we can look to get someone else in who is going to create something. And I, I think that that is what it is. It is disappointing. I have seen some comments from Mesut um, around how he feels he's been treated, um, which I can half agree with. But at the same time, as a man, you know, I always believe as a man, you have to take responsibility for your own actions. Um, and Mesut Ozil, um, in my estimation, um, hasn't done enough. You know what I mean? This is a player who, in my estimation, when you're not playing, you should be angry. You should be doing more to get back in the team. But it would appear to me that, because he's picking up his 350k, he's more of a laboured, like, well, I'm picking up my money. I don't give a shit. And with that sort of attitude, of course, you're, people are going to lose respect for you. Do you understand? So, you know, that's, that's where, for me, um, it, you know, it's disappointing. Just going back to my point about him collecting the 350k I think from my point of view I think from my point of view Arsenal the previous regime was stupid enough to give him that deal do you know what I mean if if Liam goes into Sainsbury's tomorrow and the store manager says to him Liam we're gonna pay we're gonna we're gonna pay you 100 grand a week or 100 grand a year um to do your current job I, I'm pretty certain that Liam wouldn't say no to that I know I, but then again I know Liam's got his morals and whatever but I think the average person, not maybe maybe not pertinent to Liam, but the average person is going to bite your hand off. 100 grand a week or 100 grand a year in Sainsbury's, of course they're going to take it. Do you know what I mean? So you can't, you can't blame Mesut, you know what I mean, for, for doing that. I suppose we all think differently because we all have our different standards and ways of thinking. Mesut Ozil, for me, he, he's gonna get, he isn't going to get that sort of money again unless he goes to China. Um... And a good point, Jay. I've just seen, uh, is it Jamie's? Yeah, I've seen Jamie's comment and he's, and he, he's made the point that I've made to someone else is that I would expect Meza Ozil to produce what David Silva and Kevin De Bruyne do. Because for me, Kevin De Bruyne is a better player, but Kevin De Bruyne and Ozil are similar type players in that they, they're, they're there to create, thread the passes in. But look how much work Kevin De Bruyne does up and down the pitch, up and down, creating chances, scores goals as well. So for 350k a week, you say Arsenal are getting short-changed, particularly when you consider what David Silva and Kevin De Bruyne do on less money. Yeah, great points, Nath, too, about return on investment and how not getting played should mean doubling your efforts. And yeah, um, if you're offered that money, though, you definitely take it. I mean, you'd be a fool not to, especially if you have a family to support. And plus, as mentioned in a recent vlog, um, a footballer's career can be very finite, especially with guys like Jordan, Jordan Pickford around. He jumped up Joe Hart. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good to hear what I had to say, man. Very interesting. It's quite, it's quite um, interesting just listening to what other Arsenal fans have to say as well, because it's, it's quite funny that like, everyone has a different point of view. Everyone sees things from different um, angles. Also, um, I think one of the key things Nathan said there was like, you know, everyone has a different moral compass. So that effectively is going to affect how you view situations as well. A question just to kind of finish off. Um, PR wise, who do you think this whole saga reflects worse on? Is it as it was a player, as it was a man in regards to what they've said um, about taking responsibility? Um, Arsenal was a club or Arsenal was a business. In terms of the reflection on Ozil and the club, 
ultimately, I think the the um, Ozil is going to suffer from bad <laughs> the bad reflection. Basically, he's um, you know it's it's all there in front of us. He, he he could leave the club. He's not being held prisoner. He's on high wages. The fact that he didn't want to take a pay cut. The fact that he hasn't been playing and the fact that when he was playing, he's been very inconsistent. The fact that the manager has said, like, you know, everybody's got to work hard to get into the team. And then week after week, Mesut Ozil's not in the team. So that's basically outlining that he's not been good enough to get into the team. So everything's just there pointing at Ozil in terms of not his 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 ability, but, you know, it, it just it just makes him look like the bad party in all of this. It just makes him seem like the person that's stinking out the room. And, you know, technically, people will say this could be avoided if it avoided avoided if he had just left in the transfer window. So it's always it's always gonna be a bad light on Ozo. And you know, in turn in situations like this, I, I I don't think you know the club can people many people are gonna say the club's done anything wrong, even though people are are saying it, do you get me? But another transfer comes through the window in January. Just say we do get um uh, uh I can't pronounce his name, but if it's Aora or whatever his name is, just say we do get him or another attacking midfielder, everyone's gonna forget about Ozo at the end of the day. Everyone's gonna forget about the stale beef that the club's had with him. And the memory of Ozil is just gonna be he had a, a, a great few um couple of seasons 2016 namely where he scored where he got 19 assists but then it's going to be like ever since then he's never really achieved anything after he signed his contract you know what i'm saying so yeah 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 um ozil ozil's going to be the loser in this oh well, he already is the loser in this just looking by his response in it he already is the loser in this um yeah, just looking at all the responses from it, and yeah, I've I've made a I've made big points about um, Tory being at Barca um, and Guardiola pretty much uh, letting him go. Um, but great question from Liam um, in terms of who does this look worse on? Um, I, I don't think there's a I don't think there's a an answer for it. I, I generally don't think there's a, a clear answer for it. As a business, Arsenal are losing out. As a club, you could say Arsenal are too big of a club for for anybody like Özil to to make a make a difference or make a statement. It's like Pogba being at Manchester United. Yes, he can make a, make a statement, but in ten years' time, who's going to remember if Pogba if Pogba's still there? Um, what happens then if he says, as he said during the internationals um, the last time out, that he he would love to play and uh, play for Real Madrid? Then then what happens? Nobody's going to remember that, as as G Man said. Um, as a man, Özil, you know what? I think he's. I don't think it's a selfish reason. I think he's just done what he needs to do and and just collects the paycheck and and is. It's one of those things where you're comfortable in a position. To say, you know what? What's the point in moving? That's what it is. And with football being the way it is, the moment you move to a new club, all of a sudden you've got to settle into a new area, a new environment. Everything has to be right for you to um, to get on with with the place. Now, this is the reason why I mentioned China, because if he goes to PSG, if he goes to Turin at Juventus, if he goes to Milan, and the only one that I think he can go to between the two um, Milans is AC. Um, I think they've got more of the money than in to do. Um, if he goes to, again, I can't see P- um, Real Madrid um, signing in, but those are really the three teams. And if he, go, if he decides to join in Turkey, it could work for him over there, but it would have to be after he after his um, wages are done um, at Arsenal because they won't have the money to sign him. None of those clubs will have the money to sign him. But if he was to go to a team like in Turkey or anything like that, then you can go, okay, well, some of the places you can say, you know what, those are the places that he can get on with. Yeah, I mean, especially if you have a wife and children, you have to settle. 
and children have to change schools and make new friends and if the wife's unsettled it makes things harder as well as we've seen before but then it comes back to again what nathan and g-man has, has mentioned about his moral compass will he be able to get beyond the situations that have happened to again muslims in certain countries you look at psg they're in france muslim uh, the muslim uh, community over there is being heavily disregarded heavily disregarded um and that's 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 what it is and then obviously um i think a few a few nights ago there was a beheading of a of a teacher because they didn't agree with something politically um who so happened to be ironically uh, muslim so it goes back to those things as well yeah, politics and football don't seem to mix well at any time. Um, but yeah, Arsenal are evolving, clearly. Um, but sadly, paying debts off is a consequence of modern football. And agents definitely have a major part to play in getting in their clients' ears and making decisions. Just look at A.D. Ward of Raheem Sterling. Although that turned out to be the right decision in hindsight, at the time, A.D. Ward was going around burning bridges. If I look at it as a player, I don't know. Um as a player, you just earn your money. You earn your keep and, and you do what you have to do. If I am if I want to be, as a man or a player, I want to be on the pitch. But again, there wasn't there aren't going to be many teams that are going to go, you know what, we've got the money to, to put, uh, to dip into the funds and go, well, we can balance the books with this type of signing. As I mentioned, how are you going to um, put together a team around a 32-year-old who you know full well, he's going to be playing week in, week out, and he's going to give you everything he can in those little areas of the pitch that you need him to. Also knowing that he may not become a defensive player at the same time, because here's the, rea- here's the reality. If you don't have the ball, you're defending. If you do have the ball, you're attacking. If there's a transitional period, it will be either whether you've got the ball or if, or if you don't. So either way, you're still doing something at some point. Now, when it when you break it down even further, if your team has the ball, then you're attacking. Individually, if your team, if your um, if you have the ball, then you're attacking. Individually, if you haven't got the ball and it's in your area of the pitch, then you're defending. So either way, you're a defender. Or, a, or an attacker. That's what I'm trying to get at. And I think most people say, well, you should be creating, um, you should le- have leeway for players of his, of his stature. No, because if you look at Liverpool's team, that's not a, about all creativity or anything like that. That's about sheer hard work to be the best. That's the difference. And that's why teams like uh, Man City and, and even Leicester now, have got those those teams who are not built on one solid player. It's built on a collection of players who are willing to work hard for each other off the ball as well as on it. That's the difference between what we used to have with um, Henri when we had the Invincibles and then let's say Manchester United in 1999. That were te- those were teams that you could go... There wasn't any standout players. That was just basically sheer hard work of of teams just pretty much going through going through the motions. I'd even go as far as to say the 2012 um, Champions League final. The run for um, run for Chelsea was well. There's nobody great in that team, but together they all went. You know what? We've got this. We'll deal with it. And that's the difference. That's the main difference. Um, with us, Liverpool. There's definitely hard work to enable the creativity. I mean, look at Bobby Firmino as an example. It, yeah, it's true what you say about with Liverpool, there is a plan to allow hard work to create in danger areas, as mentioned earlier. Um, there's hard work to enable the creativity. I mean, if you're not working, how can you be afforded any sort of leeway in the Premier League? Well, I think that's, I think that's all about producing. And as long as you're producing consistently then you can be afforded that leeway. And to an extent, that's the issue with Ozil. He's not producing consistently, so he doesn't get that leeway. 
that's that's why I look at it from from all different points. I don't think there's a, a clear answer. Um, I don't think there's a definitive answer. I think with Ozil, he has he has to um, bury his head in the sand until January, get on with with whatever he's got to do in in the gym, and then hopefully somebody comes in for him to buy out, buy him out of his contract or wait until the end of this um, end of the season to bring him into um, their club only thing is because he's not in the Premier League or Europa League squads he may be out of sight out of mind which is very easy to be with the fickle nature of football these days I think the three places places that you could really see him in is um, China um, and if he's going to go to PSG or or somewhere in France then fair enough but there aren't many places that you could go and then Italy. I don't think Real Madrid are going to be looking in that direction, especially when they've brought in some youngsters now. Um, if he's going to go to the MLS, I would say they've got to break the bank, and not many clubs are going to go against the um, the FFP rules, especially around the coronavirus, um, to break the bank, regardless of where he goes. So there aren't many places that he can go. If he went to um, South, um, if he went to the Indian Super League. Or if he went to, um, where else could he go? Possibly South America, but I don't think there's much in South America and Brazil, um, in Brazil to, for him to go, okay, well, there's something that I can work with here. If anything, there's more injuries. And that's what I've noticed with, with the uh, the Brazilian league at the moment. So, um, yeah. Yeah, there's financially, it, it's just not viable. For anybody, um, for Urzo as a player, you would want to be on the pitch. I would have said, you know what, I want to. I'm kicking and screaming. I want to get out. For me, I think he's actually riding it out. I'm not gonna lie, I think he's riding it out. I think he signed the contract. Didn't know that Wenger was leaving. Realized that Wenger left. Now he's kind of going. You know what? Let's just get through the next few um, next few months, and then my contract is done. I can go. I don't think he wanted to. I don't think he wants to make himself look as bad as possible. I think he's just trying to do his best. I think the situation with um, with uh, him t- um, talking to the Turkish um, government didn't go down well um, in Germany as well as um, at Arsenal. Um, he retired pretty much then, and pretty much a lot of a lot of um, fans, German fans, were were unhappy with that because they saw it as a as a herit. Um, as he's he's now German, he's not he's not Turkish. I'm like, well, he is he's he's German. He's he's a Turkish. He's a German-born Turk, who so happens to understand his heritage. So that's like somebody saying that um, Thierry Henry um, hasn't got family in Martin um, in Martinique. Same same thing with Nikola uh, Nelka. Same like um, Zidane Zidane isn't Algerian. It's like, well, yes, they were born in France, but they were of Algerian and Martinique defend, um, descent. So the fact that you're pretty much disregarding where they've where they're really coming from, pretty much shows the lack of um, openness from your country, um, or lack of certain people, certain people's openness within your country. Um, so yeah, I don't think any any side that has got it got a better deal i think 300 grand 350 grand whatever it is a week is is pretty much taking money out of um the club's books i think g-man's got a point in terms of artes has been told he can't play he can't play Urzel, but i look at i look at that team at the moment and i think nathan said it um this team um artes has said that this team is evolving or g must have said it i'm, I'm not too sure so i apologize to both of you um, but the team is evolving, and it needs to evolve. It's, I think, it needs to evolve sooner rather than what Manchester United had to do. Because look at the signings that they've made, and Liam's made a point of this time and time again, is that Manchester United need to to win trophies in order to stay in a very competitive environment. Um, whereas Arsenal have that. Um, bit of leeway to go you know what a trophy is not going to make a difference even though it won't appease the fans it won't please the fans if we if we um if we don't i think they've recognized that it's going to be more about paying off the stadium 
um, for what they did. I don't think we're going to get the stadium paid off within the time that we've already mentioned. Just giving everything over to Stan Kroenke didn't make any sense whatsoever. So, yeah, let's just see what happens. I mean, personally, I'd say it reflects worse on the club PR-wise, um, especially during the pandemic with Arsenal making multiple redundancies. I mean, ironically, kind of saw us, <laughs> especially as we're talking about Ozil. Um, but Ozil doesn't come out smelling like roses. I mean, the thing he offered with Gunnosaurus could be seen as or a move to turn himself babyface or good rather than a benevolent gesture. But mm, as, as a conspiracy theory, but nothing Ozil was said or done before would point to him offering to pay Gunnosaurus' wages being any sort of power play or poli- politic in any, in any way, in all honesty. But as I said, I think the club comes off badly purely on the basis of the redundancies they've made. Um, due to the pandemic, plus what's been mentioned about Ozil being a high wage Wenger signing and flopping, because in my view, that makes the club look silly. I mean, I can't blame him for taking the money. I mean, plus if the club's stupid enough to pay that, then they get then they get what they get. Um, which is a player who could be very good if you play to his strengths, but he's rotten in the reserves, not being used at all. Um, it makes it look like there's a lack of foresight and an expensive lack of foresight at that, in my view. Um, with this kind of situation, well, nobody comes off looking great. And really, everybody loses apart from Ozil financially, who's laughing all the way to the bank, knowing he'll be a free agent soon. But he's taken care of his family and he's not backstabbed anyone or sold himself or anyone else out for it. For everything that uh, he's gone through, it's... I think it's time for him to kind of go, you know what, I just need to find a new club, speak to his agent, just say, write it out. I think his agent has has a part in this as well. I think he's looked at it and gone, just write it out until the end of the season and we'll, we'll do something about it after that. And that's been our special feature segment, people. Hope you enjoyed it. Arsenal and the Ozil conundrum. Now, remember, follow us on Pitch Talk, at Pitch Talk on Twitter. Tweet with us, follow us, see what we are up to. Facebook.com forward slash Pitch Talk. Search for us, man. We've got a group, we've got a fan page. Like us, become a fan, become a friend as well. Become a member of the group. Also, at Pitch Talk on Instagram as well. We put videos on Instagram and IGTV as well so have a look out for us youtube.com forward slash pitch talk for videos as well including our archive material mixcloud to check out our pitch talk show archives from back in the day as well and also as well keep up with us pitchtalk.blogspot.com for blogs as well remember we've got vlogs we've got videos myself straight shooting lja the g-man jesse fizzle jbk and nathan arsenal as well we're bigger and better than ever as a team so make sure you join the revolution join the pitch talk team until next time thanks for joining us for this pitch talk special feature see you next time peeps Pitch Talks special feature.